Praise the Lord, everyone. It is so good to be here on, I guess this is actually the last Sunday of January. This is also the final Sunday that we deal with this music stuff. We've been doing this for uh, several months now, and I've got to tell you, um, it has been quite an adventure um, going through these songs and uh, giving me personally um, an appreciation for those that really take their songwriting seriously and biblically. And um, it's opened my eyes to quite a few scriptures as well that um, have really come to inspire me. And so we're not going to be long-winded, or should I say I'm not going mm -hmm. to be long-winded, because I believe we have a lot to cover. So the way that we're going to do this is that um, we are really dealing with two songs with basically the same name, uh, but one is a hymn, one is a worship song, uh, one was written by Charles Wesley, the other written by Hillsong. One is whew, really deep. One is pretty simple. They all focus on Christ. And we're going to see through what Myra shares and through what I share um, exactly how these songs fit into the gospel message or do they fit into the gospel message? So I'm going to ask my beautiful wife, Myra, if she will pray us in, and we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. All right. Bless the Lord. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus. And thank you for another opportunity to share the word and thoughts about you, because it's all about you, Father. We just thank you for blessing us and enabling us to have this platform that all will hear and hopefully will be edified in their relationship with you, who is, who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We love you, we honor you, we praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I've got the hymn. Are you going to play it before? Um, you tell me. I, I, you I'm, can play it. Okay. All right. You want to tell them... Uh, it's by Charles Wesley, who was a prolific uh, writer. He wrote at least 6,000 or more uh, songs. Well, he, it's poetry, but he, it, it turned into songs. But he was prolific, and it reflects his life, and some of them are very famous. This one I never knew before, so I was still more familiar with the other version of Jesus, Lover of My Soul. But I, when I looked it up, I found a lot of significant uh, places that it had affected people's lives. So it, it's written, I didn't have the date, but it's written a long time ago, like in the 1800s. And it, it was mostly famous during that time. But, it's, uh, but I can see why. But Mac is going to play...
myself but had played the, a recording of it, my first impression was, boy, that's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> not, the, not the words, but just the music. And we talked about it. And <laughs> he said, it's dark. I said, it sure is. And it, that, you know, made me think, you know, why does that affect me? Because I know my temperament. I like to listen and see things that have good endings and are uplifting. And he said, because depressing things affect me. And I said, that's true. But when you read the words, he's really expressing, now someone else did the music, but it's, it's really expressing the darkness of this world. Mm -hmm. And that's what's around us. But his, the words are telling us what is our comfort, what is our joy, what is our peace. It's in the presence of the Lord. And the first line in itself could be just everything right there. I mean, I could just stop right there with this, Hesu, lover of my soul. And that's, that's profound because we all want to be loved, but Hesu, lover of my soul. And it brought me to a number of different scriptures, but the first one was, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Now, God loved the world, so he loves his son. And that love that God has for Jesus, that's who he, I mean, he's loving himself, basically, because that's who he is. He is full of love. He's not loving himself. That's who he is. He just exudes love. But the love that Jesus gives us, because that's the big issue, because God, from the beginning of time, seems so far away. It's evidenced all in the, in the Old Testament, except for Adam and Eve, who really had an intimacy with God and lost it. But from that point on, no man have, had that kind of relationship that lasted. I mean, even Abraham was a friend of God. But he messed up. I mean, everyone that has walked along this path has messed up. But Jesus gave his life and sacrificed everything that we consider important. Mm -hmm. It's all about us, right? And it made it more real. Even in this song, um, there was a testimony of, of a man who heard this song and he said, if God loves me so much through his son Jesus, why am I walking the path I'm walking? Basically, he said that and, and got converted because he could see the love of Christ in the song. He says, let me to thy bosom fly. Now, who doesn't want to lay on their mother's breast? I mean, even if you don't have mm. a mom, even if you never had a mom, that is, is, is something about that loving relationship and that that security but to lie on the bosom of Jesus wow that is beyond human imagining it, but he says in this let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll while the tempest still is high because it's in the world in this world, we will have tribulations, but be of good cheer, because Jesus says himself, I have overcome the world, but this is in the world. And he's saying, hide me, O oh my Savior, hide, till the storm of life is past. When is that going to happen? <laughs> when it's over. Yeah. When this world is, as we know it, is no more, because there will be storms forever and ever and ever. Safe into thy haven, guide. And that reminds me that, you know, we need a God. That people talk about these spiritual gods. You know, God is the God. Jesus is the God. The Holy Spirit is the God. That's it. There's no other spiritual gods out there that can keep us and deliver us 
and 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 enhance our lives in a way that no one else can. It says, "Oh, receive my soul at last," because that's what's important. It's our soul. This is all. This is temporary, but one day, when this earthly body is gone. We will have a spiritual body, which we should be walking in now, because we do have a spiritual being within us through the Holy Spirit that wants to be in domination over, I don't like that word, but domination over our own spiritual body. But we need to put, allow him to do that, because he's not going to do it by roughshodding over us. But he has the best for us. It's like, you know, People, I remember years ago, um, in a situation, people were saying, like, what, well, being a Christian, I have to do this, I have to do that, I can't do this, I can't do that. And the Lord says, no, I have something better for you. So that you want to, de you desire the very best. Because you know the very best is who he is. And that's what changes a lot. It's not about, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. You don't want to do those things because you're not walking in darkness anymore. You're walking in its light. And it says, other refuge, I have none. There's no other place we can no. go. Mm -hmm. Hides my helpless soul on thee. We're helpless without him. Leave or leave me, not alone. We want his presence. Or do we want his things? I, I was reading a little bit about the different names of God. And I love... Jehovah Shalom. That's the peace of God. What about the presence of God? I mean, all those, all of it's good. But what about his presence? Even the peace of God is kind of selfish because we want it for ourselves. But his presence, that brings peace. His presence. And we don't want to be alone. Still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stayed. He's making a declaration. All my help from thee I bring. Cover my defenseless head. Because he knows that he needs him. With the shadow of thy wing. He's helpless. He needs him. Oh, thou, O oh Christ, art all I want. Can we say that? Mm. Can we truly say that? He is all I want. More than all in thee I find. Because everything we need is found in him. Raise the fallen, cheer the faint, heal the sick, and lead the blind. <laughs> That's a beautiful testimony. Just and holy is thy name. I am all unrighteousness. Vile and full of sin I am. Thou art full of truth and grace. Plenteous grace with thee is found. Hear that? Grace to cover all my sin. Now he just said, I am all in righteousness, vile and full of sin. But he knows the grace that comes from above will cover all of his sin. Mm -hmm. Let the healing streams abound, because it's a process. Make and keep me pure within. He doesn't just say make me pure. He says keep me pure within. Thou of life, the fountain art. It's like drinking from that fountain, that water, that pure water. Freely let me take of thee. There's no hindrance. He has it all. Spring thou up within mine heart. Rise to all eternity. And where's our eternity if we want to live? A life that has a future? When we die, we be we who are saved will be with him. Is that it? No. It's a continuous life. But do we want to live eternity with him? Or do we live want to live eternity in the darkness, in the abyss, mm -hmm. without any hope, without any real future? It's like who knows what it's like, but it's not tempting or delightful or fun. We know the devil has nothing for us. But he wants to destroy us because the love of Christ destroyed him. Even though I remember years ago in my early life as a Christian, 
a darkness came into my room. And I, you know, I didn't know what to do. I, I, it frightened me. I mean, you there's always light. No matter when you turn the light out, there's always some kind of light. And I knew in my spirit that it was the enemy. And it just kept coming. And my heart just opened up and I said, you know what? God loves me. God has shown his love by sacrificing his son. But he will never love you. He will never forgive you. And I kept saying this. He will never love you. He will never forgive you. And that light went away. I didn't have to battle with him. To say, I'm not afraid of you. Come on. Mm -hmm. You're just foolish. But <clears throat> God put it on my heart to say the truth to him. That love. Because that's what he wanted. He wanted to be loved and adored. He wanted to be God. But no one loves us like God. No one sacrificed for us like Jesus. And no one is living with us with that love except the Holy Spirit. And the enemy has no part of that. He will never receive that. He can't be like a John and lie on the bosom of Jesus. That will never happen for him. And that's his weakness. Because we don't understand the love of Christ. It hurt. But his love to be given to us. He sacrificed. And we've made love into a catch word. I love this. I love that. I love who I am. I love what I want to be. It's all about us. And Charles Wesley, I think, was expressing his conversion, but this was written after that. I've, I've read different things and we've talked about yeah. it. And we have different opinions on it, maybe, but the idea was in the, what I read about it, his life before, he was a missionary, he was devoted to the work of the Lord, but it was all about him and how he looked and how when he died, I mean, he wrote it down that he would, how he would present himself before the Lord. It was all about him. And when he truly got converted, these are the words that, some of the words that he was able to express because he could see it was all about God. It was all about Jesus and his sacrifice. And one of the things that really got me, my testimony, was this scripture in Ephesians 3, accepted in the beloved. In the beloved, the same love. The beloved, he loves me. He loves you. He loves each of us to life if we are willing to accept it. But the scriptures, Ephesians 3, is says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. It didn't say in this big house you have here. It didn't say the car you have or the luxurious food you may be able to eat every once in a while vacation you can go on. It says with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in, in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons. As sons. Those of us who are mothers and fathers, Truly, we love our children. And we don't just look at them and say, well, it's a child. No, we love them. But he adopted us. He chose us. He chose us. Imagine, I would think, and I know it's hard to be adopted because I've, I've adopted two and my husband has now become father to two more children. Actually, three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I adopted two long ago. And they came with a, a lot of baggage. And it, it was hard for me to understand why they couldn't see that. That they were chosen. And that's our flesh that wants to hang on to the hurt and the disappointment of being rejected by some humanly person. That may not have been able to take care of them or because of whatever circumstances could not be there for them. But God, 
has chosen us and has adopted us as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. We are adopted with all our mess. He loves us so much. He said, I'm adopting you, Myra. I'm adopting you, Matt. I'm adopting you, you, and you. And, and we want to think about all the things we've been through. And I'm not saying, you know, I'm perfect in that. I have my moments, but then I remember, wait a minute, I'm not going back there. I'm going to be like Peter, which was one of the greatest things he ever said to me as, as far as some, some of the things he said in the Bible. When Christ said, are you going to leave me too at one point? And he said, no, where am I going? I don't want to go back to that mess. I don't want to go back to being depressed. I don't want to go back to that. I want to stay adopted in the presence of the Lord. Adopted as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He took pleasure in doing that. Isn't that nice? It pleased him. He made a decision. And all of that to the praise and glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. That scripture, that phrase touched my heart so much. It changed me. Even though I was saved, there were things I was still dealing with. But when I captured that scripture in my heart, it changed my life. And it's still changing my life. Because he accepted me with all my flaws, all my insecurities. I'm accepted in the beloved. And there's that love. He is the beloved. He is the beloved Christ. God so loved the world that he gave his beloved, begotten, only begotten son. To save us from this world. He said, well, what's wrong with this world? Everything. <laughs> Unfortunately, Adam and Eve, you know, they had a perfect place, but they chose. And unfortunately, it was the woman who led the way. But I have to say that woman you gave me. But no, he made that decision to listen to her. So he was blame shifting on her, but he, he didn't take responsibility of his part. And that's, that's where we are. Because we have forgotten that Jesus, the lover of our souls, and that as men and women of God, we should have a standard. A man should be right below God, hearing from God, leading his family, his wife, his children, his community. And the woman should be hearing from her husband, knowing that he is hearing from God. We've lost that. In so many instances, not all, thank God, not mm -hmm. all. <laughs> but that's where the family structure has come apart. Because <clears throat> what is a marriage? It's supposed to reflect Christ's love for the church. We are the body. We are the church. That love mm -hmm. is for the church, for the congregation, for the gathering, as my husband uses that word frequently. But it is. And we are the church. Jesus, lover of my soul. Where's the passion? We use that word love for passion. Promiscuity. We have a passion. I can't get away from this person. They, I have a passion for them. But they use the word passion also for what Jesus bore. I'm not sure where that came from, but I looked it up a little bit. It just meant the suffering he went through. I don't know if that's one of the Catholic things, but it's interesting. If we use it in the, in the pure sense, he had a passionate love to endure the cross mm -hmm. for us. He was so passionately in love with us that he took the assignment and he completed it. For us, that's passion. That's intimacy beyond the intimacy of the flesh. It's the intimacy that we have with him if we allow ourselves to look 
beyond ourselves and within ourselves and to know and recognize that he who is in us is greater than he that is in the world that tries to distract us into the things of the world but to realize that the love of Christ is within us that passion for him will change our relationships will change the way we think the way we look the way we perceive things because his love is living within us as Christians and it should draw others to us to want to know about that we should be as passionately in love with him and allow that passion to be demonstrated unabridged with no apologies no like ideologies no well I, maybe I shouldn't do that but openly, unashamedly, as he did for us. He made himself vulnerable for us. I want to ask permission, Myra. Can I can I play the second sure. second verse? Okay. Yeah, because you, you kind of mentioned it um, when you were sharing. And so I just want to play that a little bit. I'm gonna give briefly, and I promise you, briefly. Uh, some comments that I have based on this song as we then transition into the other Jesus lover of my soul, which is the worship song through Hill Song. So let's see, let's see. I'm going to try to play this maybe even a little bit slower because I want you to just hear the words. <laughs> Just as you were sharing, I was sitting here and you actually said some things pertaining not to what you said today, but what we talked about last night. And you kind of answered a question I think that you had. It, it was centered around this uh, word conversion. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about 
you had a relationship, uh, you know, in the Lord, but it was when you uh, read that verse in Ephesians mm -hmm. where you realized you were accepted in the beloved. It took what you already had, but it fulfilled it. Yeah. Okay. And I think that <clears throat> when we relate this to Charles Wesley, because it seems like Charles Wesley, in a way, I would, I, let me not say that he was just going through the motions as far as pastoring and, and sharing the word of God, but he hadn't gotten to that place of really knowing that even he was accepted in the beloved and that with that acceptance, normally what acceptance brings is also self-reflection mm -hmm. on where you've fallen short. So I was thinking about that, and I know y'all going to crack up because this is definitely a Christian message, but you guys, back in the day, this would have been around, I think, 1976, there was an album that came out by Stevie Wonder. <clears throat> that album was called Songs in the Key of Life. Yours truly probably knows every last word yeah. of that whole album. And y'all know it was not only just a double album, but then it had another separate disc that had four more songs on it. But within all of those songs, there was a song that was called Joy Inside My Tears. And this reminds me of that, in that Myra talked about, oh my gosh, you know, it's so, mm, I, don't, I don't want to say dark, but it definitely has a, a sadness within the music. And just for people that don't understand instrumental music, the way I played this song, and the way it's actually written is in a minor key. And minor keys tend to bring on a sadness, brings on, um, gosh, um, a, 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 a mourning, uh, and I'm talking about M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. It brings on a reflection, um, sometimes not so good. And when Myra was sharing, I thought about the original name because this wasn't the original name of the composition. Uh, when Charles Wesley wrote this, he wrote it as a poem called In Temptation. And it's when uh, an, another gentleman, his name escapes my mind right now, but when the other musician then put music to the words. It's a combination of whatever Charles Wesley's words reflect. And I think we can definitely say that these words are biblically sound. So we won't go into a deep dive on verse by verse. But when you put in the instrumental part of it, I totally understand it because there is actually a joy within the sorrow. The sorrow is reflecting on who we were, okay? The joy is knowing that he is a lover of our souls. And I could imagine, again, I'm just using my imagination because there's not much that's actually been written uh, by Charles Wesley himself about the inspiration behind all of this. But I'm going to just use my own imagination to just say because he was coming into a conversion, we'll call it that, part of him was still 
reflecting, oh my gosh, what a wretch am I. As he's also receiving this um, unconditional love from a Savior that offers that to you too. And I'm talking about you guys. And so, as I thought about it, I actually, I've been playing this song, uh, both listening to it, but also playing it. And I just add a few of my own touches to it. But I like it. I, I mean, I like it. it Myra's right. It, it really fits me because I, too, I am so happy to be in the Lord. And, and anybody that has met me personally, know all I do is joke around and, and have a great old time. But you also know that most comedians mm -hmm. are actually operating out of deep, deep pain. And I would probably say I do the same in my own way. And I think all of this came out in this composition. And so I want to thank Myra for, you know, sharing her thoughts on this and, you know, giving us that uh, reference in Ephesians. She didn't tell you that's one of her favorite passages, but that, that fit in perfectly. And now I want to transition. And I don't think I'll be as long, I don't think. But <laughs> but I want to go into this other Jesus love of my soul by Hillsong. And I want to say this up front. I have certain issues with the ministry that comes out of Hillsong. And, and notice I said I do. Um, because of doctrine. And, and I'll leave it at that. And um, if you look at enough Christian programming uh, on social media, you can find arguments for why the Hillsong product is good, and you can find just as many or more of why you should run away from it. What I like to do, to be fair, is to take every message or every song and judge it by its own merits. And that's what I'm going to do with this song because I'm going to be quite frank with you. Uh, just musically, man, I like this song. It's not much to it. When you compare this song to what Charles Wesley wrote, it's like, wow. You, you know, uh, honestly, there's only one verse, and there's one chorus, that's the whole song, as far as Hillsong's version. But we're going to listen to it, and then we're going to go into, is it biblical? And so, hang on with me again, because I'm going to try to...
just really reflect on each line and see if each line lines up with the Bible. And so it starts off just like the other one. Jesus, lover of my soul. And for that, um, I went to the book of Lamentations, and that would be chapter 3, and we will read verses 22 through 23. It says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And the reason that I, I, I went there and, and this is going to really make Myra laugh, too. This is coming from the book of Lamentations. <laughs> Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. The yes, the weeping prophet. And again, the theme is, is that through the tears, through Jeremiah understanding that he had an assignment that was never going to be well received, he would still, because the Lord encouraged him, he would press forward. But in the book of Lamentations, lament is sadness. And so I just think it's funny that the hymn reflects that this, this sadness, but the joy of the Lord within it. But in Jesus' Love of My Soul, the worship song, this was the only passage that I could actually get to to make that line fit. Jesus, lover of my soul. Because again, guys, the only way that we can acknowledge that Jesus is the lover of our souls is to understand our souls were wretched. And, and that he would love the filthy mess that we were. My God, I, I, I so connected with that. And I don't know if the writers in Hillsong were thinking about this at all, but hey guys, you guys asked us to do these songs, and so you wanted to get what we got out of it. Myra went to Ephesians, and I had to go here, just in that first line, Jesus lover of my soul. But it doesn't end there, because then it goes, Jesus, I will never let you go. And for that one, I went to Joshua chapter 23, verses 6 through 9, and then 11. And so look what it says here, starting at verse 6. It says, Be ye therefore very courageous to keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, that ye turn not aside therefrom to the right hand or to the left, that ye come not among these nations, these that remain among you, neither make mention of the name of their gods, lowercase g, nor cause to swear by them, neither serve them, nor bow yourselves unto them. But here we go. But cleave, that would be like never let go, cleave unto the Lord your God, as ye have done unto this day. For the Lord have driven out from before you great nations and strong, but as for you, no man hath been able to stand before you unto this day. Then we drop down to uh, verse 11. Take good heed, therefore, unto yourselves that ye love the Lord your God. We never let go because God has given us some guarantees 
when we don't let go. He will fight your battles. He will also allow you to prosper, not just a physical prosperity, but we're really talking about a spiritual prosperity in the safety of, huh, going back to the first song, his bosom. <laughs> so I'm trying to interconnect these two songs. So then in that next line, it says, you've taken me from the miry clay. This one is the easiest one because uh, it's coming from the book of Psalms. Let me get to it real quick. Psalms 40 to be exact. I told you, I'm going to get through this really quick today. Um, so Psalms 40 verses 1 through 3. I waited patiently for the Lord and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Here we go. He brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust the Lord. And I'm telling you guys, when you read all of Psalm 40, it's incredible. But those first three verses, when we relate it back to Jesus, love of my soul, by Hillsong, it says, you've taken me from the miry clay. What the song didn't have the space to do is to tell you that through coming out of what the Bible refers to as this horrible pit. Can y'all imagine being in a pit and and usually with a pit there's no way of escape because even if you can see the opening at the top it's so far away there's no way to climb out of a pit because they purpose a pit that when you go in you don't come back out so that would be the schemes of satan that would put us in the pit but God, who is faithful and just, also realizes that within that pit is what they call the miry clay. And it's from that miry clay, which is very, very hard to get a, a footing on it. And I, you got you to gotta really think these things through when these things are written in the scripture. But let me go back. It says, you know, that... And the writer here waited patiently for the Lord. And eventually it says that the Lord then inclined his ear to hear. And he brings him out of the miry clay, Myra. You like how I did that? Yeah. Miry, Myra. Okay. <laughs> but then what does he do? He sets my feet upon the rock, which is solid. Sturdy. So can you imagine coming out of the pit and then being placed on the rock? And we know the real rock is Christ. And when you stand on the rock, that pit no longer exists in your life. And then by standing on the firm foundation of the rock, it establishes where you go from that point on. Guys, let me just give you a quick, quick lesson that if you put your confidence in Jesus, you guys don't have to spend a whole lot of time wondering what is my purpose. You just do what God has instructed you to do. We keep making it selfish, really, because we're trying to say, okay, where can I fit in? What can I do? When God is trying to just, as the Bible says, establish you upon the rock because maybe you need to stay on that rock for a minute before you start going out and trying to purpose stuff for your life. This is so key. Again, I don't know if Hillsong is thinking in this manner, but I've got to make this song make sense to me. And so when I read that you've taken me from the miry clay, I'm taking it all the way, and now, Lord, you have put me on the rock, and, and, I, and, and, and now I know that wherever I go, wherever my feet shall trod, that you 
are with me. And then, here it is, for all those that love music, he puts a new song, or there's a new thing going on. Hey, that's like Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley in the hymn, he had a new song too, because he was in a horrible pit. He didn't probably realize it in the beginning that he was in the pit, but when he really experienced Jesus Christ in the fullness of what Jesus Christ really means, then, my God, he was put on solid ground and he came out with a new song. <laughs> and, and from that song, it gives praise unto God. And here's the good part. When you are faithful to God, he will make sure that everyone around you will fill him through you so that the fear, and this word fear really means just reverence. Reverence and respect of God will always be there. It's kind of like Myra, when people are out there cussing and stuff like that, then you walk by and they say, oh, excuse me. You know, excuse me, excuse me. You know, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know what? I used to say, don't worry about it, but you know what? I stopped that. I said, thank you, because that is not so much about us. That's about acknowledging the Christ in us. So when we read this or sing this going forward, you know, you've taken me from the miry clay, get a, a whole new understanding of what that really means, because, again, the song you know, and it actually does take us, take us there a little bit because the next line is set my feet upon the rock. All right. And so let's go to Matthew 16 and we're going to read verses uh, 17 through 19. Let me, hey guys, I am fingering through this Bible. So it's not like being on the computer. So I mark stuff out to make it a little easier for me. But anyway, Matthew 16, verses 17 through 19. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. I went to 16. Now, 17. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Guys, just taking that by itself is so profound because whenever you see little portions in the scripture that speak to uh, the Holy Spirit uh, being invoked through people. Uh, and, and, and keep in mind, at the time that this encounter came, uh, came to be, uh, this is before the crucifixion, so we are still basically dealing with the people that were operating in the law. Okay, so they had they, they had no concepts of salvation. They had no concepts of Christ being this fulfillment. And so for Simon Barjona to say, hey, you are the Christ and the son of the living God, that was revelatory. That was incredible. You have to put things in the context of when it was said. Okay. Then it goes on to say, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, okay, and upon this rock, and, and we're going to talk about this, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, contrary to popular belief, this does not make Peter the first pope, as some would speculate. In fact, Peter, even though his name defined is Petra, meaning rock, the way he's referred to by Christ, by Jesus, let me say it that way, by Jesus, what you need to understand that the, the foundation that was being built here isn't Peter, 
The foundation is Christ. It is the foundation on which all of us might be saved. And, and, and this is so important to understand because people butcher this thing so badly because they just say, oh, Peter, the rock, which means that, oh, everything is, is now established through him. Don't get it twisted. Yes, in the book of Acts, we will see that Peter was the one who would stand, but never, ever was any kind of foundation of anything built upon Peter. It was built upon Christ, and we stand. That solid rock that even Jesus' love of my soul talks about is talking about standing on the foundation of Christ, on the fulfillment of everything that he has brought to us as a gift through salvation. And lastly, in verse 19, it says, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever shalt uh, thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. But understand this, these, uh, the, the kingdom of heaven just speaks again to about a location. Kingdom of heaven is the place that we all who believe are wanting to be a part of where we will reign with Christ. He is the high priest and we as his royal priesthood. And in doing that, yes, Peter was the one who would stand up later on and would, you know, when the question was asked, what shall we do when everything was going crazy in that upper room? And Peter is the one that says, number one, uh, that we need to uh, repent, okay, and then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So all of this, I'm talking in the future, but none of this had happened when Jesus said this. And so when, you know, it says, you set my feet upon the rock, ain't talking about Peter, talking about Christ as the solid rock. And even that last part, and now I know. Let us go to Psalm 20. Uh, let's see, verse uh, verses 5 through 7. Let's see, yeah, here we go. All right. I told you, I'm, I'm all over the Bible tonight. All right. So it says, starting at verse 5. We will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now I know, get it? Now I know, it's just like the song. Now I know that the Lord saveth his anointed. That's why we ought to get excited. Now I know, oh, I'm saved. I'm part of the anointed. I'm, 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 I'm uh, acceptable in the beloved. Get it? I'm trying to marry these two songs. Okay, so anyway, I lost my place, got so excited. So uh, he says, now I know that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some, this I love this part, some trust in chariots. Today, that would be uh, one of those expensive cars. Some trust in chariots, and some in horses. Maybe that's the motorcycles that we see uh, all around Guatemala where we are, all right? But it says, but we will remember the name of the Lord, our God. Then it says, did I go away? Uh, what did I say? Oh, yeah, through seven. That's it. So we will remember 
the name of the Lord our God. And that's what's going on here. A little brighter in this song than the first song that Myra dealt with, but we're starting to see a few things that are connecting these together. So let me continue because I don't, uh, this is a lot more than I thought. Okay, so it says in the chorus, I love you, I need you. Psalm 18, 1 through 3 deals with the first part. I'll say, um, it says in Psalm 18, 1 through 3, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Whoa! Yeah. And let me flip over to Psalm 40 verses 16 and 17. You get there. All right. It says this. Verse 16. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let such as love thy salvation say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me, thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tarrying, O my God. Wow. <laughs> Just to reflect on that one line, but I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Now I'm hoping that the songwriters of Hillsong were thinking about it that way. We, before Christ, were poor and needy, but in Christ, in Cristo, as we would say, we are saved. And as it says here, we are helped and we are delivered. And so we beg God, don't make us wait. We want all of it and we want it now. Not the stuff, not the chariots, not the horses, but we want you, God. We want you to have audience with us. We want you to spend time with us. We want to be able to pour out to you. And we want you to pour out to us. Because you are the lover of our souls. And remember, a lover of your soul is talking about the very love of your consciousness. This is not, this is not physical in any way. It's loving your consciousness, loving the very essence of who you are, the way you think, the way that you apply things. He's the lover of that. When I think about who I was before Christ and what we like to call stinking thinking, man, why would Christ be the lover of that? But my God, when we come out of the miry clay and put our feet upon the rock of Jesus, I have to believe, Myra, our thinking changes. And because it changes, uh, he, he becomes that lover. We know that we need a lover. This is not sexual, y'all. This is intimacy. This is intimacy with a presence that's higher than we could ever be, knows more than we could ever know, can do more than we could ever do. And so then it goes back to the song, and believe it or not, we're almost there. Though my world may fall. Well, you know what, to be honest with you, I hope the world would fall. Because if the world is falling, it puts your uh, entire reliance on him. 
But we're going to go to that famous passage in Romans. Uh, we're going to go Romans chapter 3, I believe. Yeah. Um, so in Romans 3, starting at verse 21, going to verse 24, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Before Christ, everything was by the law, and it was established through the prophets. Then in verse 22, it says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have, past tense, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I want to jump into verse 24 too. Being justified. Listen to this, y'all. For y'all that like to stay sinners, listen to this. Being justified freely by his grace. Not anything that we've done. We, we don't deserve any of this, but it's by his grace through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. The redemption means the price that was paid through him by grace. We are judged freely and are free and we do not have to succumb to the nature of sin ever again because it was settled at the cross. Then in the song it says I'll never let you go. And so for that we're going to go to John Chapter 15, verse 7, and then verse 16. So starting at verse 7, it says easily, If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Understand this. Believe me, if you're in Christ, the things that you ask will have nothing to do with material things. It'll have everything to do with things that align with kingdom thinking, kingdom of God thinking, mm. kingdom of God thinking that will get us to the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> All right. Then in verse, uh, what did I say, 17, did I say that? Uh, no, 16. In verse 16, it says, I love this, ye have not chosen me. But I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Again, the things that we would ask in Jesus' name would not be the superficial but they would be the supernatural, those things that are above, those things that are heavenly. Those are the things that we ask for. And I want to say something else here. When it comes to man's idea of ordination versus God's way of ordination, men put you before other men, and then men have you so-called prove that you have an understanding of God and the Holy Scriptures, and then men determine whether you now qualify to be something. I, I'm not lying. No. No, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. But isn't it something the way God does it? God chooses us, and he ordains us. 
And it doesn't have to be a physical audience. You can have an audience of one, and that one is God. I, I mean, Isaiah received his ordination when he said, Here am I, Lord, send me. He said, you know, interesting enough, it happened in the year that King Uzziah died. And, and for some of us, we need to let those King Uzziahs in our presence to die away. And the King Uzziah that I'm thinking about is traditional way of understanding ordinations, understanding uh, callings and, and all of these things. And understand that if God has set your feet upon the rock and he's taking you from the miry clay and he's the one who then establishes you and directs you, why in the world do you ever need a human being to then have to justify you when the scriptures have told us that it's through God himself that we are freely justified in him. And so... It, I'm going to tell you guys, it will take all of the, the weight off of you to know that, man, there is a liberty that something, they're not telling you about it. You know, but me and Myra, we're telling you about this beautiful free, freedom that you can have by simply allowing God to be the head of your life and Jesus to be the lover of your soul. And two more things. My Savior, my closest friend. That takes us to the book of Proverbs 18, verse 24. You all know this, but let me read it. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh Closer than a brother. My God, my God. Uh, listen, a man that has friends must show himself to be friendly. How could we ever have a friend if we haven't initiated the openness to, you know, be friendly and say that, hey, we're open to relationship. And that's what's going on here. But when it says, but there is one. Hey, Kristen, there is one who sticketh closer than a brother. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I am an only child. I don't know, honestly, Myra. Not only do I not know what it's like to have a brother, but only recently did you even know you had a brother. Okay, so neither one of us are coming from a place where it's hard as Miguel. Um, neither one of us can actually relate to that. I grew up only child. She grew up with sisters. But in the concept that your brother is one that is basically ride or die, he, he, he or she is, is not going to leave you twisting in the wind, even in the worst of storms. And when the Bible says that there's one that stick up even closer than that, my God, that's Jesus. Because only Jesus could fulfill that. And in the, the song, it says, my Savior, it makes it personal, my Savior, my closest friend. If he's a close friend, you don't want to do anything to mess up that friendship. Because trust me, real friends are hard to come by. And so when we say that a man that has friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother we can have blessed assurance that that one that sticks closer than a brother is in fact Christ. All right, so we're getting to our last
part of the verse. For those that are catching up with us, um, we're talking about two songs that are basically Jesus, Lover of My Soul. We're on the second one that was done by Hillsong. And he says, the last part, I will worship you until the very end. And isn't that apropos to close out on this? Uh, in Psalm 34, 1 through 3, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name forever. So I find it really interesting as um, I'm going to let Myra make comment in a second. But I find it interesting as we close out the first hymn that so sorrowful yet joyous. I, I like to see it that way. This one, it ends in worship. I will worship you until the very end. That's a really heavy statement because that means that through every perilous situation, I will worship you until the very end. Okay. And so... With that said, Myra, any general uh, thoughts before we start to wrap this up? After all that you've said about this song, I'm beginning to like the other song better. Because it's more descriptive, it's more, um, it don't, I hate to say this, but it's almost, this second one seems almost superficial. Okay. Compared to the depth of the expression that he went through. You know the different things that he was saying. It's a beautiful song, but that's I think that's the difference in the way I can't say all to make that word. The way things have developed in music, that the poetry and the passion and the some of that has been lost by these statements, and then he's Charles. Uh, has put his heart and passion into the words yeah. that he's used. So that I, it was interesting because I like the song. And then when you went into all that, I can see it in the scriptures. Yeah. But I don't really see that in the song as much. It's kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting because because you you know what I was thinking, darling. I looked at Charles Wesley's Jesus Love of My Soul as the complete, think about it as a novel, the complete novel. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the Hill song as the cliff notes. Right. That's okay. good. That's a good Yeah. So that, that's exactly it. And, and, and let me, because I, I know you, you always like to be gentle, but I, I, go, <laughs> I go for the throat. So... Honestly, honey, what it is, it's lazy writing. It's lazy musical composition. Um, it's like a jingle. It's, <laughs> yeah, kind of, because, because it goes through, I mean, what I just did in covering the Hillsong version, they just repeat the same thing. In the Charles Wesley song, we only, well, I only gave you um, I only gave you the um, first two verses as far as playing it, but um, there are four verses in this song, and like Myra said, you have one man who is pouring out his soul, literally. While with the hill song, it's catchy. Mm -hmm. yeah. But 
I, I found myself too gravitating to the first one. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, I came up on Jesus Love of My Soul, the, the Hillsong song. I mean, like literally when I when I received Christ, that song was in rotation and I'm like, whoa, this is, woo. Um, but my God, when I got to Charles Wesley, and I was dreading it because I said, first of all, there's so many words there. Yeah. But you notice, neither you nor I had to actually line this up with any actual verses other than what you shared in Ephesians 3 because the writer made it so apparent what he was talking about. And there's no way in fact, if I wanted to sum up the the Charles Wesley one with one scripture, it would be Psalm 91. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he it seems like he found the secret place of the Most High and he's abiding under the shadow of the Almighty. That's that's really what I get from Charles Wesley. Here, I don't get, you know what it is, baby, and, and I promise y'all, sorry, but th these things are happening and we're getting all kind of reflections uh, after the fact. You're right. Um, it's so vague. It doesn't talk, it doesn't even hold the writer accountable for their missteps. It just says, it's like talking about a great experience after the fact. While I think Charles Wesley took us through his experience into the marvelous light, we're just seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, tunnel here, and it's just a repetitious kind of thing. Now again, there's a guy that I listen to by the name of Spencer Smith, you guys on YouTube, y'all probably know him if y'all listen to Christian stuff. He would take the, the Hillsong version and he would just throw it out the window because what he would say is that all it is is repetitions. And you know what? In this case, he's right. Similar to last week when we were talking about Jairo. Mm -hmm. okay. Just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm enough. He's enough. It's enough. It's enough. Oh, okay, come on. Okay, we got it. It's enough. But to sum things up, guys, and we're going to let you go. Go. Um, we've had so much fun going through these songs. It has definitely made both of us really uh, take a listen going forward to what people are calling worship music or calling hymns or spiritual songs and um, I thank all the people who made these song suggestions this is we're going to cap this off and next month we're going to go into a whole new thing based upon uh, four people that have submitted their favorite scriptures. Myra and I uh, just owe a debt of gratitude for all of you all that continue to give us encouraging words and keep us in prayer. And please continue to do so. Um, and so with that said, again, I'm going to ask anything else you've got to say to cap off. Then guys, have a wonderful rest of the evening in the Lord. And remember to have that peace that passeth all understanding, it shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God bless you and good night.